Um, for those of you who may not know, the Academy Forum is a program that is uh, organized and funded by PAMCA. Uh, it is to bring to campus outstanding speakers who will engage our students and our faculty and our families. And it is also our pleasure to be able to open it up to uh, the larger community. So we welcome you all. We're really delighted that you've uh, braved the elements to join us tonight. Before we get going uh, with our program tonight, there are just a couple people that I want to thank for making it possible for us. Uh, first, uh, Amy South. Amy, where are you? Amy's around somewhere. Amy is our community vice president. Uh, there she is in the back. <laughs> she is uh, ultimately responsible for, for the entire event tonight. Uh, next is Lucy Batsik, and Lucy is in the door right there. Lucy has executed every single detail for tonight. Uh, we have Trish Perlmutter. Um, Trish is, has shepherded this program from uh, the very beginning. And last but not least, Judy Polonofsky and Debbie Kozak, who uh, make absolutely everything happen for us here at MKA. So thank you very much. So now, uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the headmaster of the Montclair Kimberly Academy, Tom Namick. Well, good evening, and welcome. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Montclair Kimberly Academy, and I want to also thank again our Parents Association. Uh, they have made this evening possible for us. While the program is free of charge, um, it's not free of expectations for how we will conduct ourselves as an audience. I have a couple of things I'd like to ask of you. Uh, please, there's to be no uh, electronic uh, recording audio or video. Please don't hold your phones up to take pictures, mostly because it distracts the people behind you. And we'd really like to focus on our very special guests this evening. Um, it's my privilege to introduce our guests, and uh, I think they're well known to all of you, uh, but I do want to say a couple things about them. Um, Dr. Tyson has been a frequent guest on the Colbert Report, but, uh, or rapport, I guess is the proper <laughs> pronunciation. Uh, we're delighted that he's here, and we are also delighted and uh, uh, very grateful that Mr. Stephen Colbert has agreed to interview him for our benefit. Stephen Colbert, comedian, author, and host of The Colbert Report, is both one of the funniest and possibly the bravest comedians of our time. I want you to consider his performance at the National Press Club dinner in 2007. As he, uh, as he stood just a few feet from the President of the United States, known to the rest of us as the most powerful man in the world. Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, astrophysicist, director of the Hayden Planetarium, author of nine books, teacher, lecturer, host of NOVA's four-part series, Origins, and member of two presidential commissions on the United States aerospace industry and the future of our country's space exploration. Dr. Tyson has a gift for working successfully within the realms of research, education, and policy formation. I owe you all an explanation about our theater tonight. What you see on stage is the beginning of a set for a seventh grade production of Romeo and Juliet, this year's selection for uh, what is, as I said, an annual performance. And I think it's fitting that Dr. Tyson uh, is going to warm up the stage for the two most famous star-crossed lovers in all of American literature. Um, it occurred to me that there are a few things that Stephen Colbert and uh, Neil Tyson have in common, and I wanted to comment on them. Both of them share an overarching purpose to make sense of the world. They also share a common strategy. They often look to the stars, human or heavenly, for evidence of how things work. Though Stephen Colbert is far tougher on the objects caught in his gaze, whereas Dr. Tyson is only known to have obliterated Pluto. <laughs> they share methods in their respective fields, whether, whether it is the search for evidence that makes sense of the world and the universe, or the creative construction 
of questions and tests by which the truth and significance of who or what is before them are evaluated. Perhaps then, they both have something in common with William Shakespeare, the desire to provide their audience with a lens to see the world from a previously unconsidered point of view and not just as others would have us see it. So while the stars may be dazzling, training and instinct appear to have taught each of them to look away from celestial bodies. I'm really sorry, I have to get that bad cliche in there somewhere. <laughs> and to consider the effects that those celestial bodies have on everything and everyone around them. In addition to the challenging questions that each of them make us confront, their work has given the world a little more of that very rare and gem-like substance known as the truth, or in Stephen Colbert's case, truthiness. <laughs> and we are very grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Stephen Colbert and Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. so much for coming today. Yeah, no, it's, I'm, I'm, uh, thank you. Miss, uh, Mr. Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson is, um, he's been on my show six times, and often when I come out to greet the audience before I do my show, they ask me, who's your favorite guest of all time? And I say, not just for volume, but it's Neil deGrasse Tyson, <laughs> because not only uh, do I love what Neil knows, but uh, I love that he loves what he doesn't know. <laughs> always interested in the next thing to learn. Oh, yeah. And always roll to whatever idiocy my character wants to throw on him. <laughs> I think the only time I ever surprised you, as you told me a little while ago, uh, was uh, I asked you, should, uh, should scientists go to Argentina or hike the Appalachian Trail? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I want people to talk about them. <laughs> The yeah, universe talking yeah, there. I think that, we're that, that, there. The universe amplifies. Yeah, that one. What I that, I missed that one. Yes, you'd miss that news story. Yeah. So I, I, to go on a show, it's like the hardest interview ever. I have to like I'm laden with current events just <laughs> to mix with my science because I don't know where he's going to come at me, and I got to be like ready with seven tennis rackets to hit it back. <laughs> And I'm upset because that one news story, remember with the guy, was it South Carolina guy? Who remembers? <laughs> <laughs> he, he goes to Argentina and becomes well known for having done so. And yes. you ask me straight out, should scientists visit Argentina more often to become better known? And it just went, I just, you aced me on that one. You're welcome. Now, Neil, uh, we've got a lot to talk about tonight. Yeah. A lot of subjects. Science is a big thing. But I want to start off with... This is not a bribe. Okay. I want to start off with... What's um, these chairs? I feel myself sliding. <laughs> no. I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> this when I first walked in, I said, oh, welcome to the barn raiser. <laughs> <laughs> I realized we were speaking before the Amish tonight. <laughs> That's going to make it tough to talk about science and technology. All right, Neil, I, I want to start, um, I want to start in, a, in, a, in a broad way. Are you tweeting now, or are you actually trying to interview me? No, I'm just looking at, I'm just looking at photos of myself. <laughs> got a little, little work done. I need a little freshen up. Now, let me ask you a very basic question. Mm -hmm. Science, mm -hmm. from sky, uh, scientia, in Latin, meaning knowledge. I didn't take Latin, but I'll take your word for it. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Is it better to know or not to know? I think, well, my blunt answer is it's better to know. All right. But that, I is, can, that, is, that is debatable, though. Uh, well, I said it's my answer. Yeah. I mean, somebody else might have a different answer. For instance, Oedipus might have a different answer. Yeah. <laughs> Is, is, is knowledge always a good thing? I have to say yes. Why? Because it empowers you to react. 
and possibly even to do something about it if something about it needs to be done. Okay, but who we are is what we know, right? Which Part of who we are is what we know. And our identity mm -hmm. is often based on how we see the world. Yes, and our personality for sure. And if we learn something that does not jive with how we think about the world, won't we have to re-examine who we are? Yeah, it could mess you up. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Once again, I'll go back to Oedipus. <laughs> he plucked his eyes out rather than know anymore. Yeah, the, well, back, you know, people back then, you know, they did stuff like that. Yeah, pe people back then, not people today. Um, so, so I think... There's, you know, there are people who would not know, who, who would rather... I remember the old days, I don't know if it still happens, where a doctor would find out if you had cancer, they wouldn't tell you. They right. wouldn't tell you. Give and, it to me straight, Doc. Yeah, and why would you even have, have to say, give it to me straight, unless there was a day when they didn't give it to you straight? I'd like, if I have five years left, I want to know I have five years left. Because I'm going to, like, do something different in those five years. If I, Neil, yeah? I have some terrible news. <laughs> So I'm, but there are some people who don't want, there are, there, are, there are some people who don't value science. And if they don't value science, are they valuing ignorance? Yes, and, but I will not pass judgment on them. What I will say is, if they are at maximal comfort in their ignorance, fine. Except that they will not be the participants on the frontier of cosmic discovery. They will be disenfranchised. Hello? Hello? I'm sorry, I've got a phone call. Hello? I'm sorry. I have to, ta I have to take this. Hello? My mic isn't, my mic isn't working? Hello? Now who's in control? So they won't be in control of the, of the next one participant. No, no, they, they, won't, they won't. Not only will they not be on that frontier making any discoveries, they're not in a position to enhance their life for having access to those discoveries themselves. Can knowledge ever be a bad thing? I don't think so. What about actions that knowledge takes us to? Do you think that Oppenheimer, when the bomb went off, and he said, I am become death, destroyer of worlds, do you think he perhaps questioned for a moment whether the knowledge they achieved that led to the creation of the bomb perhaps should have been left undiscovered? Do you know what he said in response to those kinds of questions? Yes. He said, because people said, Do you, have you usurped the power of God? Have you? And he said, 